وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعْجَبٌ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters, welcome to another Q&A session on the Hot Seat Podcast where once again I'm joined by Ustad Abdurrahman Hassan where he's going to answer your questions on misconceptions of bid'ah i.e. innovation in a Muslim society. Check out the end of this episode to find out how you can ask questions on any of the topics we cover on the Hot Seat Podcast. Ustad Abdurrahman, the first question I have for you is... If somebody wants to build a good habit of doing a particular act of worship in a particular time, then why would that be considered to be an innovation? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'in alahum bi ihsanin ila yawmi deen amma ba'd. When it comes to ibadah, a worship, which is a loose translation, when it comes to ibadah, we should do it in the form and the way that the Messenger والسلام, did it. We have to follow him in the amount. We have to follow him in the timing. We have to follow him in the place, in the description. All of this we have to follow him in it. But if a person chooses to do an act of worship on a particular time because it's most convenient for them and they're not trying to get closer to Allah, by that particular timing, then it doesn't become an innovation. It's like having an annual conference hmm. every year. No one's getting closer to Allah by the annual conference happening in this particular time of the year. What people are getting close to Allah with is the conference itself. The reason why it's happening this time is because it's most convenient. No. Okay. Um, the next question I have for you is, do the scholars of Islam differ if a particular issue is innovation or not? And if this does take place, then isn't there a principle where you do not prohibit evil on matters that are ijtihadi, matters that have a difference of opinion? That's a flawed argument because ibadah, it requires evidence. So if you want to do an act of ibadah, you need to bring evidence for this particular act that you're doing. And if you don't, then what you're doing is innovation. Ijtihadi, it means when one party has evidence and the other party has evidence. Both parties have v- strong evidence. The way that each party is using their evidence and the proof that they're trying to bring out of it, it's hard to determine which one is right. And now it becomes sub- subjective to the person who's looking. Is this one right? Or is this one right? Each party is not uh, unaware of the evidence that the other person is bringing. Mm-hmm. I mean, he knows his uh, evidences, and this one knows that what this person's evidences are. But what is happening here is each party, the way that they are interpreting the evidence, is probably different to the other person. This is now called ijtihad. Okay. It's a valid difference of opinion, but that doesn't mean both parties are right. Because the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if the scholar who's reached a level of independent reasoning, he can go to the text himself and extract ruling from it. If he goes and he looks at the Quran and the Sunnah and he gets it wrong, then he gets one reward. And if he gets it right, he gets two rewards. So here what you sense from this hadith is there's a right and a wrong. Mm -hmm. So the scholar is between one reward or two rewards. Coming back to the question, the ibadah is not permissible unless there's an evidence for it. And the person who's doing this act has to bring an evidence for it. So one party has evidence, the other party doesn't have an evidence. So this cannot be called ijtihadi. And not every difference is. There is a difference now. Mm. Yeah, say for example, we have a hadith that one party declares to be authentic, another party declares it to be weak. Yeah. And the party that declares it to be weak say this is an innovation because there is no evidence for it because they obviously believe it to be weak. In an issue like this, mm. What would we say about this situation? This is based upon an uh, ijtihad now. We okay. say that it's based on authenticating a hadith or weakening a hadith. This is, this is now definitely a ijtihadi-related issue. 
whether this hadith is sahih or is it da'if, that's valid. But one party is saying, for instance, we can celebrate the Prophet's birthday, alayhi salatu wasalam, and they have no evidence for it. There's no evidence for it. And the other party is demanding evidence from the ones who are celebrating to now then say, wow, there are scholars on this side and there are scholars on this side, so it's a valid difference of opinion. No, it's not. Mm. That doesn't make it a valid difference of opinion. What makes it a valid difference of opinion is that both parties have strong uh, evidences and each party is responding clearly and categorically to what the other party has as evidence. And now it then becomes subjective of what is right and what is wrong. And many examples we can give, we could say, for example, um, uh, is women wearing niqab, for example, obligatory? That's a valid difference of opinion. Mm. If is leaving the prayer uh, uh, out of laziness, are you a disbeliever for doing that? It's also a valid difference of opinion. Because each party is pushing their arguments and their evidences, and the other party is doing the same, and each party is responding to the other person's evidence. So it's a valid difference of opinion, but again, there's one party who's right and one party which is wrong, but it's subjective which one is right, which one is wrong. Okay. The next question I have for you is, does every act of innovation make someone an innovator? Uh, not every act that a person does makes them an innovator. You see, there's a different, the scholars distinguish between the act being an innovation and the doer being an innovator. Not necessarily does everybody who does innovation become an innovator. No, not at all. Great scholars have spoken about this. Uh, not everybody who fell into innovation does innovation fall onto him. Great scholars have spoken uh, about this. Sheikh Albani rahimahullah spoke about this. Sheikh Mubaz and great other scholars have spoken about it. And it's a concept that can also be used for the, con uh, for the issue of takfir as well. Mm. Not everybody who does an act of kufr becomes a kafir himself necessarily. So, no, not necessarily, no. If a person does an act of innovation, he doesn't necessarily become an innovator unless, of course, the proof is established upon him. And remember, we spoke about this uh, in our podcast uh, on the issue of uh, the first podcast that we did, mm. Who Can You Trust in the da'wah, the Modern Day Da'wah Scene? And we said that it depends on what issue does the person fall in regarding innovation. If it goes against Ahlul Sunnah in a fundamental issue, okay, then yes, the proof needs to be established on that person and whatever ambiguity or unclarity that is there in their eyes or whatever is keeping them in that opinion is removed from them. Then, inshallah ta'ala, the person becomes an innovator after the proof is established on them, of course. Okay. But uh, that's dependent on one type of uh, issue of the religion but there's another issue in the religion that if the person does he automatically becomes an innovator uh, for example if the person says i reject the uh, i reject single hadiths in aqidah that just goes into a concept of um uh, the source which we take evidence from evidence from this person becomes an innovation innovator even before the proof is established on him. No. Is this the only condition? What if, what if, is ignorance a condition? Like, for example, you might have someone who's just a follower of an imam. He doesn't really have any knowledge of Islam. Oh. Uh, and he might, for example, reject singular narrations based on what his imam is telling him. Mm -hmm. Would we then also call him an innovator? Or how, do, how do this thing See, work? See, this issue of ignorance and establishing the proof is one of those issues that need tafsil as well. Because it really depends on what type of issue are we talking about here that this person is ignorant about. Is it a fundamental issue of the religion? Mm -hmm. That's a different discussion now. Is it, uh, what, what, where is this person residing? Like what type of land are they in? That's another thing we need to look at. We also have to look at the individual himself. What kind of person is he? Is he new to Islam? Or is he always a, Mus always a Muslim? Uh, also, what's his type of capability of comprehending? All of these when the scholars take into consideration, then they say the proof has been established on this person and the proof hasn't been established on this person. So this requires a specific circumstance, specific scenario, it needs details for that specific case. Definitely. And in terms of the one who is, say, uh, uh, someone who is claiming to have knowledge, an imam, a leader of community, and he is calling to his innovation, would we still need to do all of these things or would we just say, okay, in this circumstance, then he's an innovator? Again, whoever, whether he's calling to the innovation or not, again, the proof needs to be established on him. 
Um, but we do need have to we do need to understand the concept of uh, a person who has innovation, but he doesn't talk to anyone about it. Mm. He keeps his innovation to himself. He believes it at home. Scholars they deal with him different to the one who comes and propagates his belief. Okay. And they call it da'in ila bid'ati. He calls to his innovation. But like when you look at books of Jalhu Ta'adil, you realize that the ones that they categorized as to be the ones that w- need to be stayed away from is the one who calls to his innovation or propagates his innovation, not the one who keeps his innovation to himself. Because remember, they were munafiqeen with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he never interrogated them and said, what do you believe? What's in your heart? Tell us. Expo- bring out your... He never in, you know, interrogated and uh, looked at them like that, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What if somebody is associated with an innovator? You see this person with a well-known innovator all the time. Um, would that make this person an innovator as well? So when you say this person is a well-known innovator, that's subjective to who is it well-known to. Some people, they might not see that person to be an innovator. For proofs and evidences, you find great scholars different on individuals. Mm. Um, some scholars would say this person is a mubtadi'ah. And another person would say, no, he's not. Individuals were differed upon. If you look at Aima to Salaf, they differed on the individuals. You find an imam say this person is this, and you find another imam say this person is this. And what we have to understand is that that labeling of the imam on that person, the labeling that he's putting on that person, is an ijtihad. Mm. So I, I really want to explain something. Okay, I, for example, I'm a reliable person to you. You trust me. I go out and I tell you, Akhi, you know brother Umar, I'm a brother Abdullahi, I'm a brother Ahmed. I saw him drinking. Wallah, I saw it in my two eyes. I'm a reliable person to you. You would have to trust me on what I said because I'm reliable. I'm not li- you, know, you don't know me to be a liar mm-hmm. because Allah said in the ayah, Ya ayyuladina amanu in ja'akum fasiqun bi nabain, fatabayanu, and then the qira'a says, fatatabatu. If a fasiq comes to you with news, then verify it. But if he's not a fasiq, you don't need to verify. You take his word for it. That's what the ayah says, which is a mafumul khalafa, the reverse understanding of the verse. Good. But that doesn't mean I now place a label on that person and I say, he's a fasiq for drinking alcohol. You go, mm-hmm. as for you seeing him as an, as, as for you seeing him drinking alcohol, I trust you, you're a reliable person, but I'm not going to take your ruling from you. The ruling is another thing. Do you see? Mm-hmm. So there's a khabar and there's a hukum. I telling you about what I saw is a khabar. It's a news and based on the ayah, you'd have to take my, ver- my word for it if you don't, if you trust me. But my ruling is something else. Okay? Okay. That you can reject or accept. You can accept or you can reject. So you find these principles scholars talk about a lot. Sometimes some scholars, they bring qawaid which is al-jarhul mufassar muqaddamun al ta'adil that the the detailed criticism takes precedence over the ambiguous um, the general praise. But then again, on the other flip side, the scholars, they say, Kalamul Akarani yutwa wa la yurwa. The statement of the peers is tossed and it's not narrated. So you'd have to, you, there are two principles. One should not eliminate the other, but you should learn how to reconcile between them and how to deal with it. So the point I'm trying to come to is great scholars, Ibn al-Qayyim and others have explained this in great details that the issue of if this person is an innovator or not is an ijtihadi related issue, sarahatan. Mm-hmm. And people will differ or, upon it. And so placing a person, an innovator, because you saw him with someone merely because he's with someone is not correct. It is incorrect. To say that this person is an innovator because he sat with this person uh, is not necessarily. And some may then quote some of the aim to self doing mm-hmm. this and saying, oh, so-and-so is with then فَأَلْحِقُوهُ Then take him to it. Then what we say is that these are qadaya al-a'yan, specific scenarios that these imams saw and you can't generalize them. And I have the statement of Ibn Taymiyyah to, to back me up on that. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, clearly and categorically, he said, and explicitly he said, that sometimes you see statements of the Salaf, Ahmed and others, and Imam Ahmed and others, they would criticize a person. And when they criticize that person, he said that it's restricted to that particular situation. It's restricted to that situation. Ahmed saw something in that particular individual that needs to be observed in what whoever comes after. Not just he, he boycotted him or do you see my point? Yeah. So this is Qadiya to Aini La we say. It's a specific situation that generalization cannot be 
stipulated from it. You can't generalize it for everybody. So are you saying all of the statements from the Salaf that have reached us about being careful who you befriend and seeing someone to be with an innovator and therefore declaring this person to be an innovator, all of these are for specific scenarios that we can't no, apply? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying, no, I'm, I, I've clearly said before that sitting with innovators and being with innovators is prohibited and you're not allowed to. But when it comes to who's an innovator and who mm. isn't an innovator, differences may occur. Remember, I might differ with you on saying, for instance, you and I both believe that Allah is above his throne. Okay, You and I don't differ. Shahid, you believe Allah is above his throne? I believe Allah is above his throne. Mm-hmm. You go and you come to me and you say to me, Brother Ahmed here believes Allah is not above his throne. I then look at you and say, I don't agree with you on that. He does believe Allah is above his throne. So your m- argument of saying that he's an innovator is based upon something, a premise that I don't agree with, Aslan. Right, right, okay. You and I here are not differing on whether Allah is above his throne. We agree b- with each other on that. And we also even agree that if a person believes Allah is not above his throne, it's a deviation in his aqidah. What we're differing here is, and our difference here right now is, whether this person holds that opinion. You see, yeah. I might say I've sat with him, I've spoken to him, I've seen him, I've s- I've traveled with him and I never saw that from him so maybe you must have heard wrong or maybe you must have you must have a personal grudge with him or something else that I see that you you, you want to you want to push something against him you see my point mm-hmm. so then you don't turn at me and you then say you're defending innovators no I'm not I actually don't believe he's an innovator in the first place because for you to say you're defending innovators means I believe he's an innovator and I'm still defending him so the scholars they call this a natija you're coming with a conclusion that we haven't all, we haven't even agreed upon, we haven't agreed on the uh, the, the the premise that you're you're, you're picking up from, and okay. this is many khilafat that have taken place between brothers in the da'wah scene. It's because of this. Hmm. This person, we looked at him, we observed him, we realized his da'wah is clear. <laughs> he calls to the kitab, he calls to the sunnah, he calls to the understanding of the pious predecessors, and then maybe he differs with you on a particular person. He say, no, 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 I believe this person Salafi. And then you say he's a mubtadi'ah because he argues and he debates for the criminals uh, and uh, he's, he's arguing for them. I'll say he doesn't believe he's a criminal in the first place and he doesn't believe he's an innovator in the first place. But what is different is you, you don't ever tell us your mu'taqat. We don't know what you believe. You hide your belief. Hmm. You're tr- when you're asked about your belief and what you hold, you're always nervous. You don't want to talk about it. And always you're around a particular type of people. Then this is a valid reason to criticize this person. Or this is a right to question this person. What does he actually believe? What is his stance? What is his view? Do you see my point? Right, yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, uh, the final question I have for you, and this is not just the, the issue of bid'ah, but also a question that has been reoccurring throughout many of the episodes we've done on the hot seat so far. Um, why does it feel like you're always dividing the Muslims, declaring everybody to be not necessarily an innovator, but always focusing on issues of innovation, focusing on being careful who you take your knowledge from? Why does it feel like you're always dividing the Muslims? No, I'm not dividing the Ummah. That's not true. Um, what I'm actually saying is that, you see, first of all, what I want people to understand is when you warn against a particular people and you say, don't take knowledge from these type of people, these people can harm your religion. Why is this seen as a division? The same wouldn't be used for if I was to tell you don't go to this doctor. He's corrupt. He's known. He's a fraudster. He's a charlatan. Don't go to this man. You would say, Jazakallah khair. Allahu Akbar. You kiss me on the forehead and you say, Jazakallah khair. You've told me you know, what's beneficial for me. But when it comes to masalihu dunya wa akhira, the benefit of this dunya and you're hereafter, you look at me and say, why, why are you backbiting people mm. the same with a sister if, if she wanted to get married or a brother wanted to get married and I said Ahi, stay away from this person they're known you know they're evil they're this they're that he will look at me and say Jazakallah khair you saved me from a problem that's one thing I want us to always keep in mind if a person tells you about a person and says to you stay away from this person look into it look into it because this is your akhirah this is what you're gonna you know you've got one chance in this world this is the only chance that you have so make sure that you, you verify, you look into it. Number two, does every type of division, is it blameworthy? It's another question that we need to ask ourselves. Is every type of division, is it blameworthy? 
And is every type of unity praiseworthy? We find that not to be the case. Our Messenger والسلام, when Quraysh came to him in Mecca, this is Quraysh, Ibn Hisham mentions in his seerah the story of uh, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Utbah, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah sat, he came to Mecca in the assembly of Quraysh. And the Messenger والسلام, had walked in onto them. But he went to the corner to pray, alayhi salatu wasalam. And then Utbah said to Quraysh, whilst they were sitting in their gathering, he said, shall I not go to Muhammad and present something to him? Maybe he might take it from me and this may solve a great calamity, harm that we're going through. Mm. They said, of course, <laughs> go to him. So he went to him and he said to him, ya ibn akhi, my brother's son, my nephew, you have a big place in our hearts. You have a place in the tribe. You're a well-respected and admired individual. Look what he said. He started with that. And then he went on to saying, if you're looking for kingdom, no, he then said, what you've come with has divided us. You have insulted our idols. You've declared our forefathers to be in the hellfire and, in, and, and disbelievers. So what did he say that? فَرَّقْتَ بِهِ جَمَعَتَنَا You've dis- you broken our ranks and divided us. And he did divide them, alayhi salatu salam. How did he divide them? He took a father and the father became a Muslim and the son didn't. Or the son became a Muslim and the father didn't. In a household, there was a Muslim and there was a non-Muslim. So division came from the messenger, alayhi salatu salam. He came to a people who were united upon shirk. And what did he do? He divided them upon what? A group of them took Tawheed and a group of them took uh, Shirk. The Battle of Badr, a father would be on the side of the disbelievers and the son would probably be in the side of the, the Muslims. Mm. And that was, everyone knows that in the Sirah. So not every type of disunity or a division that a person brings is necessarily bad or evil. What if somebody says this isn't a very good example to use because you're talking about dividing the Muslims from the kuffar, mm. whereas what we're talking about now is the division within the group of the Muslims. I'm not looking at it whether it's kuffar and Muslims. I'm looking at dividing the Muslims in terms of what is right from what is wrong. Mm. Here there's a wrong path and here's a right, right path. Whether that wrong is disbelief or whether that wrong is innovation or whether that wrong is a sin. I'll give you an example. A mother would say to her chi- children if she had sons, you know, don't hang around with your older brother because he drinks and he sells alcohol. So she divide him from his own brothers. That's common. Everyone does that. You see, I'll tell you something funny. A lot of us already are dividers, but it's just diff- how do how far would we go to? Like for example, you go to a brother and you say, "Akhi, would you work with a Rafi and Shia?" I say, "No, no, no, never, never. No, I won't work with him." You see my point? Mm. Another one will say, I won't even work with the Dio Bandi. So the one who wouldn't work with the Shi'i is a bit, f- he would work with the Dio Bandi, but he wouldn't work with the Shi'i. This one just said, you know what, I'm just going to take a step a step before you. I'm just not going to work with the Dio Bandi. But you and I both agree that we won't work with innovators. Mm. You just are not consistent. You pick and choose which type of innovators you don't want to work with. Do you see my point? Yeah. So the concept of dividing can sometimes be praiseworthy and sometimes it can be what? Blameworthy. Um, and Allah loves us to unite. And again, coming to the second point, which is, is every type of unity praiseworthy? No, it's not. No, it's not. And every type of unity is praiseworthy. The type of unity that is praiseworthy is the one that the people agree with each other on their fundamental beliefs. You see, we will not necessarily agree on our jurisprudent beliefs. I might believe that my wife breaks my wudu if I touch her. And you may not believe that, for instance. I might follow the madhab of Imam Shafi'i in that issue and you may not follow that and you might follow the Hanbali madhab, for example. We might differ on that. That division is not going to cause us a problem here right now unless we, try, unless we use it in an evil way. Mm-hmm. The one that I'm trying to say that we need to unite on is the aqidah that we need to reunite on. Our mazdar al our mu'taqad and our belief. We need to. Let me make it even, when I say aqidah, let me even make it more broader. We have to agree on, with each other on the usul of the religion. Because there's some fiqh issues which are fundamental. So I bring that in as well. We need to agree with each other on the foundation, the fundamental issues of the religion. Um, if we don't, 
then uniting is not a praiseworthy issue. Allah said about the Jews, تَحْسَبُهُمْ جَمِيعًا You think they are one. Allah then says, وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَتَّى But their hearts are different. Meaning each one believes different to the other one. But they pretend mm. to show the people that they're united. Prophet ﷺ, he told us, you will straighten your lines and you will straighten your lines. أَوْلُ يُخَالِفَنَّ اللَّهُ Oh, Allah will make your faces and your hearts go different directions. You will not be united. Just by going up against the Prophet ﷺ and not straightening the lines, we'll be divided. Imagine bigger than that. Do, do, do you see my point? Yeah. We're disunited because we're going against the Messenger Sallallahu way and the way that it is. So I'm just saying, and I've looked at it, Wallahi, on all different levels, I looked at it through the text, the Quran and the Sunnah, I looked at it rationally, I don't believe a, a false united front is going to benefit the Muslims. I say that with sincerity, Wallahi. I, if it would, I would be our champion for it. I would, I would, Jump on that opportunity. Why not? But the, I don't believe that's a solution for the Muslims in the West and in the East that you give them a false uh, impression that we're united, we're here with you guys and give them that. But when cl doors are closed, you guys all saying different things. I've sat in some of their circles. They discredit one another. They put each other down. Not because of, because of statements and beliefs. He'll tell you that that brother is... But as soon as the speakers are on and the microphone is on and the lights are switched on and they're on the stage, it's a difference. Shaykh, fadl, speak. I find that very hypocritical. Mm. I personally do a lot. Was this ever the way of the Salaf? Did the leaders of the Salaf ever have differences between themselves but to the general masses they presented like they were together? Never. Why was the great scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah who we now consider to be one of the, the greatest Islamic revivers why was he spending his life in prison? Why? Why didn't he just be silent? Why was he causing division? Mm. You know one of the things he got in prison for? Ta'liq al-talaq. A concept of fiqh. The issue of divorce. That was a con he wrote a two thick volume book on it. And this was the issue between him and Subki. And then also Ibn al-Qayyim was prisoned because of that as well. By Subki. No. Great scholars were never silent. They spoke the truth. They said what they believed. They criticized, they scrutinized. That's exactly what our religion is about. To purify the ranks. So people are, you know, correct and right in their approach. Because if we're not united upon our approach, each person is going to grab somewhere. Each person is going to grab somewhere. And we're not going to get nowhere. Just, well, just one last thing, because I think this is a very important topic. It's basically, right now, it's very, very relevant. Um, and I think you mentioned this on the podcast before, but I think it's worth clarifying again. What if... We both agree on certain things. We're, we're, we even disagree on fundamental issues of the religion. But we both agree that we don't want our kids to be taught homosexuality in schools, for example, or to be called towards atheism. Mm. And we have the West who are trying to push these kind of beliefs. Is it okay for us to unite on this, to try and counter the, the, the issue of this, of the West? Nah, and we are. I told you this before. Yeah. Um, I, 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 it would have been better just to bring my, the book out of my library right now. Let me just get them. Can I read yeah. it from it? Yeah, of course. You did this before. So, okay, let me give you the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah. Uh, the kitab I have is called Dadul Ma'ad Fi Hadi Khayr al-Ibad. It's written by Ibn al-Qayyim. And this book is about the, the Prophet ﷺ's guidance, uh, his biography, benefits in his life, alayhi salatu wasalam. And it's this book that the prophetic medicine was taken out of. Uh, it's people ask, they say Ibn al-Qayyim's prophetic medicine is actually taken from this book. Okay. Uh, it's six volumes. Sorry, seven volumes, six volumes with the Fahras is seven volumes. And this is the best publication. It's called Dar Alm al Fawaid. This is the third volume now. Uh, page, uh, page 358. Ibn Qayyim talks about the benefits that we take from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah was a treaty that took place between the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the pagan Arabs, the Quraysh. There was a treaty that he took with them, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Ibn Qayyim tries to he tries to extract fiqh benefits that we can take from it. One of the things that he mentions is that he says, "And al mushrikina the pagans, wa ahl al bid'a and the people of innovation, wal fujuri the people of transgression, wrongdoers the criminals, wal bughat the rebellious, wal zalama the oppressors, ida talabu if they request." أَمْرًا أَيْمَتَ يُعَظِّمُونَ فِي حُرُمَةً مِنْ حُرُمَاتِ اللَّهِ 
they ask to be helped and aided in a sanctuary from the sanctuaries of Allah Azza wa They say we're going to take care of Allah's religion in mm. a particular issue. They ask help for it. They will be given to them. And they should be aided in this issue. وَإِن مُنِعُ غَيْرَهُ I want this to be underlined Even if other things are prevented from them Other things we say no We're not working with you right. We're not gonna We're not gonna Socialize And we're not going to um, Be with you guys Our stance regarding you Is clear We consider you guys to be innovators We consider you guys to be corrupt In your belief We consider you guys to be part of the problem of the Muslims But we will help you in this issue Not because we want to help you guys we believe that we're aiding Allah's religion in this issue. We are giving the upper hand to the deen of Allah. That's what brought us here, not because of you guys. It just happened that you guys came away from your falsehood and you came to the truth in this issue because that's what you're doing here. So we help you in it. He said, Their disbelief and their transgression, they're not helped in it. Ibn Qayyim twice repeats it. And other than that, we don't help them in. So we have a group of brothers who are extreme. They see an issue which the innovators might be doing something right in this issue. Or they might even see the disbelievers. A kafir will come to you and he say, look, I want to keep your messages for you. I will keep your messages. All I need from you guys is to do this, this, this for me. Mm. And it's known, it's muhaqqaq, it's known that he can do this. He has power and he has the ability to do it. And he can execute this. It is obligatory on the Muslims to go and help him in this religious obligation. Or the masajids are going to be closed, which falls under hurmat and hurmati Allah's religion is going to be protected here. Pay attention. Straight after that is done and it's finished, our stance regarding you is clear again. We carry on from where we left off yesterday. Mm-hmm. There's a group of brothers, you find that they'll say, no, I'm not going to work with you. And so they will wait for the masajids to be closed. And so they go against the prophetic, prophetic guidance. So they're not on the way of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Ibn al-Qayyim extracted it from the Prophet's action, alayhi salatu wasalam, what he did in Hudaybiyah. We have another group of brothers who are on the other side of the spectrum. They are another extreme group which say, oh, so we will work with every and any person continuously. And they ignorantly use the verse, وَتَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Help one another and aid one another in good and do not what? And do not help one another in oppression and wrongdoing. So they will say, I will work with this innovator from d- today and tomorrow and the day after and continuously and I will continue. And guess what? I won't say anything about the innovator. Mm. I have bigger fishes to fry. This individual is on one valley and the ayah is on another valley. To use that ayah is wrong. It's incorrect. It shows lack of understanding. It also shows that you are either trying to fool the people by doing that Or you are genuinely ignorant And both of them are as bad as each other As the scholars say If you didn't know Then that's a problem You should try to learn Before you use the evidence And if you did know And you deliberately try to deceive the people Then that's another bad uh, trait So what we say is That the innovators Are not worked with They are not aided They are not supported In any way shape or form but if it happens that a particular issue that honors Allah's religion, honors the deen, then they will be helped in that particular issue with the condition that their, the refutation that is made against them, um, the response that is made against them, is all your stance regarding them is well known. Mm-hmm. I just want to mention a brother, may Allah guide him to the straight path, and myself recently said something like the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, for instance, he said. He said, the Mufti, Mamlak al Arabi, Saudiya. He had sat with a group of the innovators, he said. And his pre- his, he tried to use that as an argument. He tried to use that as a proof to say that, uh, here it is. You guys have to say something about the mm. mufti now. What we say is that the mufti stance, first of all, we don't defend, or my methodology isn't to um, connect my deen with individuals. That's not who I am. I believe that the da'wah salafiyah is bigger and greater than individuals. People can do mistakes. Scholars can do mistakes. For shortcomings can come from scholars. Um, so that's one thing I want people to really understand. Okay. If a scholar goes against the Quran and the Sunnah, it's not hard for us to say that he's wrong. But even in this situation, 
will say that the Mufti alayhi hafizahu Allah azza wa jalla and any other scholars from the Sunnah wherever they are in the world will say that there is I'm a, specifically the Mufti we're talking about here his stance regarding the innovators is known his view regarding the the corrupted people of the Muslims is well known his state statements are known and his position is known regarding them mm-hmm. and it's in this issue that he sat with them was because he saw it to be a مصلحة عامة a great benefit for the Muslims. We don't agree, we don't disagree with that. We affirm that. So those are the two groups when it comes to this issue. A group that don't believe to work with the innovators all in any circumstances or situation. And there's a group of them who believe, no, we always work with the innovators. Ha, ah, what's the problem? He's my Muslim brother. We need to work with the innovators. And there's a middle path. Is always the best path is the middle. Who say, if there's a maslaha, there's a benefit for the Muslims. And this maslah is rajiha, high, with a previous position regarding the innovators. A, previ- a position regarding this group is well known. The labas. Bahurun, inshallah. You are helping the religion of Allah. You're aiding the deen of Allah. Azza wa this is not a problem. I hope Good that man. answers this issue clearly and crystal. That crystal. was extremely, extremely useful. Jazakallah khairan. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Subhanakum wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha la ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. To ask a question about any of the topics we've covered on the Hot Seat Podcast so far, then head over to www.thehotseatpodcast.com and click on the Ask a Question tab. Alternatively, you can email us at questions at thehotseatpodcast.com. That's questions at thehotseatpodcast.com.